Yes, it is Monday, it is 1 p.m., and this is Postpo and Braincast for Mostly Learning. You know, people have been emailing me, you know, why was there no Braincast last week? What can I say? It's not my fault that all bank holidays in this country are on Mondays, but also, to be totally honest, I got a bit lazy, you know, and all summery. I mean, you know, how can I not be? Look outside the window. It's nice, fresh, and sunny. I mean, who wants to sit inside and look at a bearded Greek guy? Now, the good thing about technology is that, you know, okay, you cannot get rid of me, but you can grab your smartphone, lie down on the grass of your nearest park, and indulge in some brain science. And don't forget, you can access all the recordings on YouTube and Spotify. Now, last time we saw each other, we traveled to Boston and Tufts University, where we met Professor Silberman. We talked about benzodiazepines, their use, misuse, the troubles many patients face when trying to stop them, and everything in between. This week, though, I thought, you know, it would be good to align with the warmer weather and move to a place famous for its amazing climate, Scotland, Edinburgh, <laughs> which also happens to be one of the most difficult for a Greek man to pronounce cities, as I spent years calling it Edinburgh. But why do we have to travel all the way to Edinburgh? You would be wondering amid summer. Good question. But this is where we find two of the world experts in the field of functional neurological disorders, which from now on I will be calling F and D. And why stick to one expert when you can have two, right? So, in alphabetical <laughs> order, as I want to avoid any power conflicts between them, we have Professor Alan Carson, one of the two leaders, you know who the other is, of the Functional Disorders Research Group in Edinburgh. He has published over 200 papers. He co-led the publishing of the Handbook of Neurology, all dedicated to functional neurological disorders. He's the president-elect of the Functional Neurological Disorder Society, the associate editor of Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry that shamelessly rejected one of my masterpieces a few years back, <laughs> and the previous president of the British Neuropsychiatry Association. He was awarded the President's Medal of the Royal College of Psychiatrists back in 2017, but to be honest, all of his achievements don't really matter when compared to his motorbike riding skills, or at least this is what he says. On the other <laughs> corner, Professor Joel Stone, a professor of neurology at the University of Edinburgh. If you ever came across the most famous website for FND, neurosymptoms.org, <laughs> well, it's his brainchild. Published over 300 articles in the area and led on new diagnostic criteria for FND in DSM-5 and ICD-11. He is the first secretary and co-founder of the new international FND society. He has slightly more awards from Prof. Carson, and that must be solely in an attempt to compensate for not riding a motorbike. His awards include the John Hunter Prize for the Royal College of Physicians, Royal College of Psychiatry President's Medal, and the Ted Burns Humanism in Neurology Award for the American Brain Foundation. Braincast people, Professors Alan Carson and John Stone. Props, welcome to Braincast. Hi, Prosper. Nice to see you both. So, I always start with a basic question that helps people, if you like, orientate and navigate the rest of the discussion. But with FND, this seemingly basic question has been a headache, both for patients and non-specialist clinicians for many years. So, let's put an end to that. So, what is FND? I want a definition, 50 words max. So, John, want to give it a go? 50 words, that is tough. It's one of the hardest questions, Prosper, you're right. What about a disorder of uh, voluntary motor and sensory function in which it's possible to demonstrate by means of positive diagnostic and typical features that there is a disorder of that voluntary motor sens sensory function, but preservation of uh, corresponding automatic movements and sensation within the same movement? Wow. How about that? I, I don't, so how many words was that? It sounded like I think it's under 50. <laughs> so it's, it's a disorder. It's a disorder. It's a higher disorder of voluntary movement and sensation, uh, which is related broadly to a disorder of functioning of the nervous system rather than structural change. And that's the sort of lesser lesser dualism that I'm going to use here, which is still still a problematic. And you know, the, the, the source of that headache has to some extent its roots in one of the biggest confusions in the history of medical naming, if such thing exists, as FND has been known with various different names, some of which I personally find inappropriate, such as pseudo seizures, as pseudos in Greek means a lie. 
and others that may cause confusion as they have you know deep roots in psychoanalytic theories that certainly not everyone is obliged to be aware of so alan is it important in the end of the day how we call someone's symptoms um yeah, yeah yes and no is the honest answer I, I think it is helpful to have an optimal name so we're trying to reassure people that we know what's going on and that you know the, the prognosis we're offering is accurate and yet if we call it medically unexplained symptoms which is a vogue term in lays on psychiatry it's tantamount to saying i don't know what this is whereas you know exactly what it is um you know we don't maybe know exactly what's caused it but diagnosis very accurate error rate less than two percent so i think we need to have a name that reflects it I think we need to have a name that doesn't assume a mechanism. So I don't like conversion disorder, for instance, because it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, patients tell us consistently they like functional neurologic disorder. And one of the reasons which I hadn't really twigged on, but one was explaining very powerfully at a recent meeting, is if you say I've got a psychogenic movement disorder to a friend in the street, it automatically brings on the question, why and mm. let's say it's been caused by abuse by a parent you might not be ready to say well actually my father traumatized me when i was seven um and functional smooths these over but allows people to have a conversation it allows a label that explains a bit about what's going on and it allows a helpful dialogue between different professions between neurologists and psychiatrists in a common language so I think it's emerged from the heap as the patient's choice. And contrary to popular belief, it's not that the patients think it's a euphemism and don't understand it. Actually, that's changed. The patient groups and the doctors are on the same page now. They're accepting mm. that this is a combination of psychological and brain function. And I, I think that's something we can all run together with. And I, I think it's a good step forward. And, and you know, FND is not a new thing. And in one of no. the if, if, if you like extremely rare times that are dare to challenge fellow Greeks, I have to say that Hippocrates' idea of a uterus wandering around the female body causing the symptoms that we now call functional is definitely a bit off piste. It does show, though, that descriptions of FND go back to the ancient times. Descriptions that, as bizarre as they may sound, they were not really challenged for nearly maybe 2,000 years. So, so Alan, can, can you give us a brief historical overview? Yeah, well, as you rightly say, that the functional symptoms have been described since the very earliest medical documents, possibly even the first ever medical document known the Count Papyrus. Um, oh. Times of ancient Greece, as you say, it was attracted towards this idea that either the uterus was moving or noxious gases being released. I actually was writing my doctorate, which partly included a potted history at the time my wife was pregnant with our first kid. And of course, she had many of these symptoms, she had a bit of irritable bowel, she had fatigue, she had a bit of forgetfulness, mainly caused by the fact that her uterus was moving, <laughs> growing in size. And I, it did lead me to wonder, actually, if, if that, because it's really difficult to know where it came from as an idea. And I, I just have this little notion in the back of my head. But anyway, it's clearly nonsense. Um, Things change around the time of Thomas Willis and Thomas Sydenham towards a more of a brain orientated understanding that continued through to the Halcyon days in Paris. Um, we tend to think of Charcot, Yanni, Freud, Babinski, but I'd like to just roll back 30 years earlier to Briquet, who I think really nailed it with the first case control study in psychiatry and showed by comparing a group of prostitutes with a group of middle-class housewives and a group of nuns, that the rates were far higher amongst the prostitutes. And this was not because of sexual chastity, as had been the prevalent theory of the era, but because of abuse, traumatic experiences, and poverty. And I think that was a real intellectual step forward. I think a lot of good work about mechanism came out from that Parisian group later on, Yanni's ideas of dissociation in particular, Freud's ideas of the unconscious and conversion. And then I think we can't bypass the fact that in 60s, psychiatry took a wrong turn. And because of a fight, probably over departmental funding, started saying neurologists can't make these diagnoses accurately. They all turn out to have organic disease in the infamous Slater paper. And I think that's left the legacy of psychiatry not being interested in this condition. And I think that's a real detriment, both to psychiatry intellectually 
and to the patients. It's a fascinating area. The crossover of brain and mind challenges a lot of our thinking. And I, 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 I'm kind of hoping we're on the start of a new Halcyon era where we've got the psychiatrist, psychologist, the neurologist, and critically, for the first time really in somatoform disorders, a lined up patient lobby who are all singing roughly from the same hit page. We realize that there are blanks to be filled and there can be varying degrees, but people are close enough aligned that I think we can make real strides forward in the near future. But, you know, let's focus on the present and answer the question, what speaks louder than words? And it's definitely not actions, it's money. So Christopher Stephen yeah. calculated the cost of FNV in the United States of America. Published in JAMA Neurology late last year, they calculated that emergency department and inpatient care of both adults and children with FNDs incurred total charges to the U.S. healthcare system of $1.2 billion. So that number alone, so $1.2 billion, tells me that FND is way more common than people may think. So give me the numbers, John. Yeah, the key numbers here are probably the second commonest reason to see a neurologist, are functional disorders generally. Uh, that's after migraine, and you, can, and you can debate what that what, what's going on there. Um, it probably accounts for 30% of all seizure presentations to emergency departments and half of uh, status, at least half of status presentations. The cost, therefore, must be huge, and I think that U.S. study is probably and um, probably an underestimate because this is this wow. is this disorder is not coded properly. Mm. And we're looking at a disorder that also doesn't. It's not transient. Many people think, oh, these are just patients with transient symptoms; they're going to go away. Anyway, that's not the case. A study that we we did in Edinburgh looking at patients with functional limb weakness over prospectively over 14 years showed that 80% still had the symptom 14 years later. So um, by any measure, this is a common disabling uh, disorder, often with a lot of complex comorbidity that we have been ignoring, frankly. And, you know, despite FND being that common, as you suggest, we still don't know what's causing it, which, to be honest, you know, I'm not really surprised. There's, unlike what people may think, we don't know that much about many conditions in medicine. The truth, though, is that there has been a surge of studies trying to elucidate the, the biological, if you like, substrate of FND, from Valerie Voon's beautiful fMRI experiments published in Neurology back in 2010, to the most recent review by Antonio Strapella, published in Brain, that attempts to summarize, if you like, the existing neuroimaging evidence, but also the, the review by Susanna Pick that brought the psyche and the biopsychosocial and talked up about emotional processing in FND. I know that it's not an easy question to answer in, even if I gave you, you know, the whole 30 minutes, but John, what are the key brain areas involved in FND and how do we hypothesize they are producing the FND symptoms? Yeah, so I think like many disorders in both neurology and psychiatry, we need a multi-perspective view here. So I'm going to talk about brain, but uh, talking about the brain does not exclude talking about other things. These are all happening at different levels. What have we discovered? We, we know that uh, activations on brain imaging in people with FND, generally speaking, look different to people pretending with the same symptoms. I think that's an important point. There's generally a lot more activity, I think it's fair to say. Some of the most important circuits, one is the one circuits related to agency. So the, the parts of your brain that help you know that it's you that's doing something. I think we've found, several studies have found um, the right temporoparietal junction is an important node in that network. But we're also about networks and circuits, of course. That circuit doesn't seem to be working very well in people with FND very often. Um, and also uh, studies showing abnormal connections sometimes between um, what we think of as emotional networks like the amygdala limbic system abnormally connected with motor and sensory pathways so some idea that um, there's this sort of aberrant connection which which is triggering symptoms um, I think and, and I think some of the most persuasive studies are ones that are sort of before and after in the same person so a study by Patrick Vumier and they're quite old but I feel it's still quite convincing showing areas of underactivity in the thalamus 
on the contralateral side to the symptoms, kind of what you'd expect if you'd had a stroke there, you might get hemisensory disturbance. Well, something similar happening in FND and then improving when the patient's symptoms improve. So yes, of course, there are correlations with brain. What other organ could these symptoms be coming from? Uh, so we're, we're going to see something in the brain. But I think the, what we're seeing is helping, is, is starting to map on to other ideas about, about you know, the predictive brain, uh, et cetera, in this disorder. And, and while you know, we can be talking for hours about what may be causing FND, one of the main misconceptions potentially driven maybe you know, by earlier Freudian notions of conversion, is that you know, if you dive back in the life of people with FND, you will certainly find horrible trauma. Now, a Lancet psychiatry meta-analysis by Leah Ludwig did show that stressful life events and maltreatment are substantially more common in people with FND rather than other people. However, the meta-analysis also found that the substantial proportion of these patients, around 15%, do not report a history of abuse, trauma, or significant life events. Alan, can you tell me more about this? Yeah, so I mean, I, th I think within that meta-analysis, we, we would have to acknowledge that a, a lot of the data is poor on life events is incredibly difficult. And I know the various steps like LEDs, et cetera, one can take to improve on it. but. Often with disorders in the neurotic spectrum, the type of triggers are often really quite mild. Um, so I think we have to be cautious about the interpretation. But I think what we can categorically say is that the notion that there are swathes of people with functional disorders with hidden sexual abuse just waiting for somebody to uncover it is wrong. Doesn't map with clinical experience, doesn't map with the data. and. I do find that a lot of patients I see have been traumatized, particularly younger patients, particularly in families, by people continuously searching and asserting that such abuse must have happened. Where it's present, it tends not to be Freudian in nature. In other words, it's not repressed and unknown. Patients are very open that it's happened and it was bloody awful, et cetera, et cetera. They sometimes don't want to talk about it, but they often don't want to talk about it because that's not their worry today. That was their worry over the last decade. But today, they're worried about the fact their arm doesn't work and they want to have that properly assessed before we go on to a separate thing. So, you know, the reason patients are often reluctant to talk about abuse is not because they're unaware, but simply because they want you to do something else. In the same way, if I take my car to the garage and the mechanic starts talking about, was I abused? I'm kind of like, mm, let's speak about the carburetor first and we'll, we'll deal with abuse if you make a decent job of repairing my engine. Um, mm. So I think we've got to be aware of that. But I think we also have to be aware of the gaps. None of this explains why abuse 10, 20 years earlier might cause a symptom to start on the 7th of June 2021. And I think it's blinded us to that question, which to me seems very important particularly in etiology, but also perhaps in the mechanics of treatment. So as I alluded to, the Brique paper, you know, 150 years ago said it all, um, said everything we had to say in our Lancet meta-analysis. And I don't think there's any dispute about that, but it's not the whole jigsaw. There's some nice corner pieces, but there's an awful lot more to be filled in. And we've got to be careful that we don't stop thinking, thinking trauma is the answer to everything. And I do worry in psychiatry in general, there's a slight move when people start talking about trauma-informed care to return to days of thinking it's the answer to everything. It's not, it's important, but there's an awful lot more in the jigsaw of how our brains work. And, you know, receiving the right diagnosis can be a long, tiring, and for some, traumatic even journey, involving loads of doctors, investigations, and at times, unnecessary medication. Now, while I appreciate that clinical examination may be indeed one of the most important diagnostic tools, the truth is that whether we like it or not, up to some extent, it remains subjective. And so people started looking for other ways of establishing the functional nature of symptoms. Loads of scores, of questionnaires, dissociative seizures, likelihood score by Wesley Kerr on epilepsy and behavior, Ghislaine Baroni and the Nobel scale for suspicion of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures in the journal Seizure, even actual biomarkers like pre-hospital laxative levels by Carl Magnusson in epilepsy last year. 
Irene Feynman showed that the, the theta EEG frequency is consistently associated with epilepsy, but admitted that relevant findings for functional seizures are really scarce. Now, John, where do you see the next breakthrough in biomarkers? Yeah, I don't, yes, I don't think we have any uh, reliable biomarkers for FND in terms of imaging or neurophysiology at present. Most of those things that you're talking about, like lactate or other things, are things that are trying to pick out epilepsy. So again, if you if you use those, you, you'd end up making a diagnosis of exclusion. And I want to make it real, I think this is a really important point to say FND, you might think it's a diagnosis of exclusion, it is not. You have to have positive evidence of um, signs such as tuber sign or tremor entrainment test or a typical clustering of uh, things that you see in a functional seizure. People get that wrong over and over again. This is how we can make a diagnosis in people with epilepsy or MS. And I think where the breakthrough might come is in actually refining those positive signs in a more, uh, in, in a more reproducible way such that you don't need to be uh, an experienced consultant neurologist to be sure that sure that you're making them. So I would like, so I think we already have, for example, um, good work showing how to laboratory support a diagnosis of functional tremor using various parameters. I think we can extend that to other motor symptoms like paralysis, and we can extend it to um, a more, perhaps using AI and other techniques to, to, to be more careful with our clinical features of, of functional seizures, because they have their own set of very typical features. We need to get away from saying what this is not. It's not about what it's not, it's about what it is. So I would be, I would be going back to where we make the diagnosis. These signs are telling us the mechanism of the disorder and we can, use, we can expand on them to give us our biomarkers, I think. So positive diagnosis is the most important thing, John. Thank you very much for that. So what people may not know about FND though is that it's treatment highlights how important it is to work as a team. And I have to say that at times I feel totally useless compared to the input my colleagues have, like occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, or the psychologists. Talking of who, you know, it was only last July that Aaron Fobian published results of their retraining and control therapy, which is essentially a CBT-based approach, suggesting that 100% of patients had no seizures seven days after react this is the acronym with equally impressive long-term benefits now sadly this was not the experience of people that participated in the i have to say really impressive randomized control trial led by the unstoppable professors trudy Childer and laura goldstein that to be fair did show a significant improvement in psychosocial functioning so what is the role of psychological therapy in the treatment of fnd -Allen? Well, I, I think it, it, it has a part to play. And again, I think when we're talking of psychological therapies, we need to divide them up. It's a bit like saying, what's the role of surgery in a disease? We need to think, what's the specific operation we're talking about? Um, so the CBT model that we trialed in codes was very much based around an avoidance. And I think what's important is that it didn't really help the seizures, but it helped the overall functioning. So it's clearly got a rehabilitative component and is worth doing, but it's not the end of the story. And again, this is a bit of a problem. There are other treatments that maybe look more promising directly targeting the condition. And when people are putting in grants, people are getting comments from reviewers saying, but we know CBT works. And actually, we we don't know CBT works, um, and it's certainly not the whole story. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that physio might be particularly helpful, and also that multidisciplinary rehabilitation looks very promising. But I think when you start peeling away at that, these are psychologically informed physiotherapy. So the physiotherapy mm. is based around the presentation that normally if we're doing neuro rehab on somebody, the physios will break down movement in the limb. So they'll practice moving at the ankle, then practice moving at the knee, and they'll try to build that movement back up. We know in FND that there's excessive attention paid to the affected limb. And if we build a physio model that says, well, let's try to remove that attention away from the affected limb and let's move it to the gestalt of movement, we get a very different result. So I think the way forward 
is going to be more about having psychologically informed, and I mean psychologically informed in terms of mechanisms, wider rehabilitative treatments, at least in the short to medium term. And I think physiotherapy is a very nice example of actually looking at the symptom, taking that to a psychologically based mechanism, and then using it to inform a rehabilitative treatment. And thus far, the results look very, very promising. And REACT had an element of that to it. It was a slightly different model of CBT they used. I mean, I think the outcomes are too short to know. But again, I, I think we've got to be careful about precision and also about thinking we know all, all the answers. There might be different forms of, of, of therapies have different things to offer. And we've got to be prepared to accept the limitations of the results. I do think, uh, speaking as somebody who does CBT trials myself, CBT tends to oversell itself and, and, and get a small positive result and think, well, that's the only, you know, horse in the show. And, you know, it's not really. So we've got to, we've got to look wider because otherwise we let, let down patients through the gap. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a role, but there's more to come on the story. And, and you know, while there is no there's no single medication that could treat FND, and I'm certainly not referring to medication that could potentially treat comorbidities that may in turn help with FND symptoms, it was last October that Benjamin Stewart wrote a review about psychedelic assisted therapy for FND, citing case reports as far back as 1967, when Edward Baker presented a man with functional loss of three limbs, which resolved with LST-assisted psychotherapy. And for good measure, of course, you know, there are case reports from the 50s that, you know, it either didn't work or brought other kinds of side effects. So what's your opinion, Alan? Is there any role for psychedelics in FND treatment? Well, I, th I think psychedelics have a good role in people's careers. Whether they have a good role in patient treatment is a slightly separate question, is my own view of it. Um, I, I have I have some degree of scepticism. Um, I obviously have a few years on you, uh, possible, and I, I grew up during the um, second psychedelic era in the, the 80s and early 90s, where everyone was on MDMA left, right and center. And I, I didn't see it as playing a remarkable role in people's psychological health. So I have I have some cynicism about this. But what I do think has more of a role actually is, is the use of ab reaction. I do think with a lot of functional symptoms, you start getting repetitive motor circuits that are self-sustaining, particularly in things like fixed dystonia. And they're not really reaching a sort of cortical level of thinking. They're automatic. And I think using sort of abreactive techniques to disrupt that degree of processing has some promise. Whether I will need to learn how to do LSD assisted interviews, I mean, I'm well up for it, sounds fun, but I don't think that's going to be part of my practice before I retire, it's my best guess. <laughs> but I, I do think there are some medications that are of use. Um, I think there's some low grade evidence suggesting that SSRIs might be helpful. Wouldn't be a great surprise given the role of anxiety in symptom formation. Tricyclic antidepressants at low dose seem to be of benefit in treating things like pain. We might call them comorbidities, but actually are they central symptoms is a question up for grabs. And I think keeping up people away from harm, we increasingly see the damage done by opiates in these conditions. So I think there's also what medications not to be using and helping patients manage pain in a more appropriate manner, I see as a big part of my role in medication management. And what would a brain cast be without our little friend COVID? Now, new data from the Office for National <laughs> based on a survey of patients, found the number of patients with persistent symptoms after 12 months, i.e. long COVID, jumped from 70,000 in March to nearly 400,000 in May. Now, a review article published this April in Nature Medicine lists all possible symptoms someone with long COVID may present with, and as you would expect, neuropsychiatric complications are there too. Now, I'm linking that with a really interesting article published in JAMA Neurology by David Perez, where he discusses potential association between FND and COVID-19 vaccination, clearly suggesting that there is suspicion that what was portrayed as adverse events associated with COVID-19 vaccination, it was in fact FND. And although I appreciate it may be early days, but are you expecting, either of you, are you expecting FND to be diagnosed in the long COVID cohort? What do you think? 
Yeah, I think so. So we, we've got a study up and running doing very detailed phenotyping of cognitive symptoms um, after COVID. And we are certainly seeing a lot of functional cognitive disorders as part of that. I don't think it's all functional. I want to make that clear. I think there's good reasons to predict that prolonged inflammatory response will precipitate Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative conditions. Um, ITU encephalopathies are well recognized. Um, there's strokes and there will be vascular damage, but particularly amongst those who had community-based symptoms where the initial severity wasn't as bad, the predominant phenotype we're seeing is functional with a lot of functional cognitive disorder and also a lot of persistent postural perceptual dizziness. Now it's early days and we're imaging these people collecting a host of biomarkers in CSF and blood. And of course it may be a bit of both, but I, I, I think, and speaking to other colleagues running long COVID services, there's a large proportion of dysfunctional breathing hyperventilation, PPPD, and functional cognitive disorders. And I worry that people are not looking for those using positive criteria and therefore they're being missed in the in the in the mix, as it were. I don't know if John has different views. Yeah, no, I, that's my personal experience of talking to patients. I mean, I, 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 you know, I did a session on uh, COVID-19 and FND right at the beginning of the pandemic saying, well, of course, this people having these illnesses, some of them will get FND because we know that infectious diseases, injuries and other illnesses are one of the commonest triggers for functional disorders. So why wouldn't there be? There, there is with every other infection. So it would be astonishing if there was not uh, a group of people developing disabling functional disorders after after this because it happens with any infectious disease and now the you know, the, the truth is that you know despite our efforts people with fnd are not happy and it's not just me saying that in a simple yet not simplistic study published in frontiers in urology that yes has a small sample size but still it is really interesting mahinda yogaraja compared the experiences of people with multiple sclerosis with these of people with fnd they found significant differences in experiences of care between the two patient groups, with FND patients reporting significantly more problems in their diagnosis, the treatment, more problematic relationships with healthcare professionals, and more trouble in accessing community care. And to be honest, you know, I'm not surprised at all. Average waiting time for someone to be seen in my clinic is anything between nine to 12 months. So no wonder they're pissed off by the time they see me. So how can we change that, John? Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. That was a really nice study, I thought, where just, just asking the simple question, you know, for people with relatively equivalent illnesses in terms of uh, symptoms and disability, uh, how is it that one group of patients are uh, having access to, uh, you know, empathetic health professionals willing to treat them in a multidisciplinary way in a re reasonably timely fashion, and others are having very often horrendous experience stigmatizing uh, experiences. I think we are living at the moment in a time of, you know, I hesitate to use the word apartheid, but it is a bit of a disease of apartheid going on here, where if you have a condition you can see on a scan, you get a certain kind of approach, and you might get a nurse specialist, and you might get a, other treatment, and if you don't, then people will start to even doubt whether you have a condition at all, and they will accuse you of maybe making it up, or you'll have horrendous experiences in a emergency department. I hope we do look back with some shame at the way that medicine treats people with functional disorders generally and how we have rather a distortion of our priorities in terms of how we, we elevate some patients and we uh, dismiss others. So I think, I think we've got a long way to go there. I think ultimately evidence on treatment, or I'm hoping, will make a difference. Evidence on biology could as well. Uh, but I, hope, I think evidence of treatment will be perhaps one of the most persuasive reasons for people to, to, you know, this is not a diagnosis you want to miss if it's got an evidence-based treatment behind it. Amazing. And, and that's, I think that's a really good point to close. I have so many questions, but we've already run out of time. So bring us people, Professors Alan Carson and John Stone. Even, even if you forget everything we just discussed, a good start, and your patients will thank you for it, is to read their BMJ article published last October. It's titled Recognizing 
and explaining FND. So, to be honest, you don't really need me to explain what it is all about. You need me to tell you, though, that next week we'll be flying overseas for the closing session of Braincast to one of everyone's favorite city in the world. Yes, right. New York City, just right above Manhattan, we find Bronx and our next and final speaker, Dr. Marija Kundakovic. Our topic, the female brain. Until then, Postpoint Braincast for most and Learning, over and out.